So here we are, all of us, just like 18 years back. <laughs> just like 18 years back? So before I start, and I know we've heard this before in the morning, but I need to say this, that we need to dedicate this assembly to the spirit of our comrades who fought through the immigration lines. <laughs> to the spirit of the comrades from Africa and Latin America. I met many of them after, they after spending eight hours, 10 hours, 12 hours. There was no complaint. Nobody complained. So as our friends earlier were saying, a people united will never be defeated. Now, unfortunately, that's more or less what I had to say. Uh, I have to assure you, I had a very nice presentation. Uh, uh, Dr. Eduardo Spinoza said a lot of what I wanted to say, if I may say so, in a much more beautiful language. What was left of it, Professor David Sanders, he even used some of the slides I was going to use. <laughs> and then we had two, uh, two speakers uh, who more or less said whatever little I had left to say. <laughs> so I'm going to go back to what I feel most comfortable in which is to think of myself 18 years back and think of myself now, and not just myself, but the world around us, and think of what has changed. Has anything changed? Yes. There's much more wealth in the world. There's much more money in the world. You can see it on the streets of Kinshasa, on the streets of Dhaka, in the streets of Bogota, not just New York and London. We have a lot more money. We have a lot more knowledge. In 18 years, you didn't have a cell phone. If somebody 18 years back had told us in Sawar that you can use a cell phone to translate, nobody would understand that. There's a lot more knowledge, knowledge that can, that has the potential to transform our lives. It is knowledge, it is the collective knowledge of human endeavor, which never stops. So we have a lot more knowledge, but... Okay, I love this photo. But there's at least... I have learned something very important. That when people are dying, what is important is that the banks need to be saved. In 2008, when the global economy was collapsing, what was the message that went out? The banks are too big to die. So what we have learned in the last 18 years is about the power of money, that money keeps us going. We knew that. We knew a bit of that 18 years back. But we have learned how important it is that money needs to be safeguarded, not people's lives. And we have learned these existed in the dictionary, but we have learned them afresh. Austerity. Austerity, the monster of austerity, hiding behind a nice sounding word. The deaths of thousands and tens of thousands of people. Of babies going hungry. My country. I come from a country which people believe is 
is an emerging economy? What is an emerging economy? At least we don't know. What we do know is that a large number of people still in this emerging e economy, the poster boy. India is the poster boy of neoliberal capitalism. In the poster boy of neoliberal capitalism, we still have a very large number of children who go to bed hungry. Knowledge. So medicines, new medicines, we have some, not enough, but we have some, but only for some. So I want to salute the spirit, and this is what the last 18 years has taught us, that the pharmaceutical companies, the big behemoths that we have created, can be defeated by poor activists when they come together. The spirit of South Africa, the spirit of India, the spirit of the HIV community has shown us that big pharma can be defeated, but the battle still goes on. Big pharma, what we have learned in the last 18 years, they can produce a drug which they would like to sell for $1,000 for one pill. $1,000. Take a deep breath, think about it again. One tablet of a medicine called Sophosbuvir, which treats people with a deadly kind of hepatitis, a liver disorder, was costed by the American company Gilead Sciences at $1,000. So Big Pharma, in spite of our struggles, continues. In the last 18 years, inequity has grown. You've heard that before. So we have eight people. Some of these statistics are so startling, we just read them and go on. So, I want you to close your eyes, think about this. Eight people, just eight people have more money, have more wealth than half the human race. That is the kind of iniquity that we have built in the last 18 years. Well, David Sanders, not a good thing that you did. Uh, <laughs> okay. But, so this is one way of looking at the map, where people are dying. People die. People die everywhere. But when children die, when they don't need to die, it's a crime. And these, the bloated components that you see, the continents that you see, Africa, South Asia, you have people dying. And then you have the other bloated continents where all the money lies. So Africa has almost disappeared if the ma map of the world is based on where the money lies. India you can barely see there, or South Asia. And you have huge North America and Africa. But that's part of the story. Today, in Europe, in North America, you have people dying who should not be dying. So you have, in the last 18 years, we have also learned that finally, the hunger of capital has crossed borders into the belly of the beast. The hunger of capital today haunts Europe, today haunts North America as well, and not just uh, our countries in the South. So one of my best memories of Savar in 2000 was sitting with our Palestinian comrades. Was sitting with their Palestinian comrades and, and for me, who in much of my student activism 
we would march for Palestine. But we hadn't actually seen too many people from Palestine. It was one of the memories that we took back from Palestine. In this last 18 years, Palestine has shrunk further. And we have a world which is blind to what is happening in Palestine today. And Palestine continues to suffer. But it's not just about Palestine. Palestine is a symbol of another kind of hunger of global capital. It needs wars. Global capital needs the armaments industry to survive. Remember that. It is not just, just about, yes, it is also about marching into Iraq in 2003 because it needs oil. But it also needs wars. And so in the last, 2000, in the last 18 years, we have seen how country after country can be devastated because the armaments industry needs to survive. And so these are Syrian refugees. This is a refugee boy. These are children in a refugee camp. There's a small story behind it, behind these pictures. Uh, these are pictures by a Turkish doctor. Uh, he was proposed as one of the speakers here. But unfortunately, he cannot travel out of the country. So there's a story within a story. Uh, yeah. So we have millions of people being, tra being pushed from one part of the world to another because the hunger of capital demands that entire countries be devastated. Global trade, you heard from Jane, and I don't think I have anything to add to that. And then, in 2000, we thought there was a WHO. We thought there was a UN system, United Nations. We used to take pride. WHO is going to attend our meeting. We used to take pride in the fact that there is a, a United Nations which for all its faults still exists and is neutral. It takes into consideration the needs of countries, of people in countries. So this is the United States and this is what it has been replaced by. Well, not one man. Uh, I know it's a book, good picture, so I put it up there. But the point is that global governance, which was supposed to be a nation state driven process, has been replaced by what is called philanthro capitalism. Very big word, very difficult to understand. So I'll put it simply. Andrew Carnegie, about 100 years back, who many people say was the richest man ever to have been born in the world. A hundred years back, Andrew Carnegie said that the government should not make laws, but should allow the rich people to give money in charity. So the more rich people you have, the more charity they will give to the poor people. That is, in a sense, what Andrew Carnegie uh, said. And this is what we have now under philanthropic capitalism when billionaires today determine policies because they are giving some of their money in charity and can replace. So remember that the biggest donor of the World Health Organization is the Bill and Melinda Gates foundation. So there's something that we have learned in the last 18 years. 
the hunger of capital does not stop at mere mortals. It wants to devour our planet. And as David was saying, one planet is not enough. They need more than one planet to satiate their hunger. And we are hurt, hurtling. So in 2000, climate change is something that only a few people talked about. Now, even the Brazilian president, who yesterday said that climate change is a Marxist conspiracy, <laughs> so even the Brazilian president <laughs> knows the word climate change. <laughs> no, it's oh. Okay, so I'll finish. And as a consequence of all this, what we have learned in the last 18 years is that a health is for sale in the market. It's not right to say that health is something that we demand. It's not right to say that health is a right. What is right is to say, if you have money, you can buy health from the market. So I'll finish here by reminding ourselves that the evidence of the health crisis is all around. These pictures can be from anywhere in the world. We can just change the faces and they can be from anywhere in the world. The struggle for health is a struggle for a more caring world. And I think that's what we are here together, to build a more caring world. If I can finish, I don't have a slogan. We are running out of slogans. They used it all up in the first session. Um, I don't have a slogan, but I'll end by the immortal words penned by Bertolt Brecht when he said, will there be singing in the times of darkness? Yes, there will be singing of the times of darkness. Thank you very much. <laughs>